Well, welcome along to the program. I'm Justin Briley, and I'm joined today by Oz Guinness for this edition of Why I Believe. Oz, thank you very much for joining me. Great pleasure, Justin, to be back with you. It's great to have you here. Now, this is a little segment where we ask a little bit about your faith journey, how things started off for you. So tell us about growing up. Were you born into a Christian family? I was. My parents were medical missionaries in China. So I grew up in the very turbulent times at the end of World War II, and I lived to see the climax of the Chinese Revolution and the beginning of the Reign of Terror. Goodness me. So quite uh, heady sights for young eyes, I'm sure. Well, it certainly gave me a deep sense of realism about the world. Tell me then what happened in your own faith journey. Did you essentially inherit the faith of your parents? No. Obviously, I have a number of generations of faith behind me, and that's a story in itself. I'm descended from the youngest son of Arthur Guinness the Brewer, who was a strong evangelical believer, who came to faith through John Wesley and his preaching in Ireland and gave our business a tremendous sense of generosity, social responsibility, health care, and all sorts of things for the workers and homes for the poor and so on. So that heritage is behind me. But when I was nine, my parents and I were under house arrest in China, and they were able to send me to England and school. So I had all my teenage years actually without my parents. So obviously their love and their faith and their prayers were behind me, but they had no influence in my life at all uh, in a daily practical sense growing up. And I came to faith at the end of my school years, really through one Christian friend and through reading and an odyssey of books. And on the one hand, people like Nietzsche and Sartre and Camus and people who are atheists and hated God. And then on the other hand, people like Dostoevsky, Pascal, G.K. Chesterton, C.S. Lewis. And eventually I became convinced for myself that the Christian faith was true. You obviously took that into a very academic environment at university and then in Oxford. Um, so what kind of challenges have you experienced along the way to your Christian faith? Well, I've followed Jesus now for 50 years. And I love the little statement from George Whitfield: I'm never better than when I'm on the full stretch for God. And so I love the idea of the adventure of faith and stretching yourself by seeing it where it can apply. So, you know, my doctorate at Oxford in the, quote, the sociology of knowledge, that's a mind-spinning relativistic area. And it was a challenge to think it through. But at the end of it, my faith was deeper. Uh, uh, earlier, I had studied for a number of months under a guru mm. in Rishikesh, who was a philosopher and obviously deeply involved in Hindu uh, religion and philosophy. I found that at first incredibly challenging, but at a moment when I grasped the difference between the Christian faith and Hinduism, my faith just deepened immeasurably. And those two sort of experiences have been true of all of my life. Every time I've stretched my faith, taking on the challenges, I've ended the challenge by realizing it is more profound as true. It is more profound as adequate. And I mean, so that's I, I been my story. Many people, when they encounter other worldviews, be they atheistic or other religions, tend to shrink back from claiming any special place for Christianity. They maybe reduce Jesus to the moral teacher mm -hmm. or whoever. Why didn't that happen in your case? Why for you? Well, that's a disastrous view of faith. I mean, the ultimate reason to believe is that we're convinced it's true. And if that's so, then all truth is God's truth. And then importantly, we fear no questions. That doesn't mean we have all the answers, but it means that we're prepared to tackle the questions and take on the big issues. And as I said, I'm a great believer that contrast is the mother of clarity. And a lot of people have this sloppy idea. They're all the same. Not at all. If you look at the difference between the Christian faith and atheism or Hinduism or Buddhism or whatever it is, you come back every time with the wonder and the gratitude of knowing the difference that knowing God through Jesus really makes. And is that the, this key difference for you? I, I remember C.S. Lewis, uh, there's a story, I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, of him <laughs> walking into some kind of conference on different religions and they asked him, what do you think is the key thing that separates Christianity from other religions? And he said, oh, that's easy, grace. 
Um, I don't know whether that's what, where you would put the, the key differential. What, what, what would be your take on well, that? Well, it depends. I think there are many, many differences. For example, at our conference in Oxford in a couple of weeks at the Oxford Centre for Apologetics, the whole stress is human dignity, people made in the image of God. And in today's world, that's one of the huge differences. Because for a long time, humanism was a parasite on the Christian faith. God was no longer there, but humans still had dignity. Well, more and more now, whether it's science or philosophy, that's disappearing. Are we just an animal? Are we just the product of our genes, etc., etc.? The alternatives to the Christian faith when it comes, say, to human dignity are very strong. So you could take a notion like grace, or you could take a notion like human dignity, or freedom, or truth, many, many other differences. But always you come back, the differences make a difference, and thank God for them. Mm. So this work, uh, this in engagement with other points of view, worldviews, has all fed in, I suppose, to what your current project is. Recently, you've been working on what's been called the Global Charter of Conscience. Tell us a little bit about the background to that, what it's mm -hmm. all about. Well, it's no secret that our world doesn't know how to handle differences, especially when they're religious. Many countries like China, you have government repression. Other countries like Nigeria, you have savage sectarian violence, say Boko Haram slaughtering Christians. But here in the West, we have endless violations and the mounting culture wars over what religion is in the public life. And really, there's a dueling set of visions. On the one hand, those who want to impose their faith on everyone else. I call them the sacred public square advocates. And on the other hand, those who'd like to keep religion out everywhere, the so-called naked square ad uh, advocates. And what we've done, not only me, but a coalition of people, including religious believers, Christians, Jews, and others, and secularists, this is a vision of public life which is open and free for people of all faiths, or you have to say today, no faith, although that is a faith too. In other words, everyone's free to enter and engage public life on the basis of their faith. That's freedom of conscience, but with an understanding of what is just and free for other people too. And this is the notion of a civil public square. Mm -hmm. And it's an innovative, constructive, new way of going forward and I hope England, which is now in the toils of many of these things, I hope England will not go the way, or Britain at large, will not go the way that the Americans have gone for 50 years. They had a great system, but they've had 50 years of culture warring over religion and public life, and the difference is getting deeper and more polarized and more bitter. I mean, America has always had a separation, obviously, of church and state. What, what happened in the last 50 years? Though, well, to... for 200 odd years, they did it magnificently. And then when these issues became a matter of culture wars and you had the Christian right or the religious right against the secularist left, you had the sacred public square against the naked public square, and it's got more and more bitter. Now, on the Christian side, obviously I'm a Christian, millions of people your generation are dropping out of faith altogether because of the ugliness of the Christian extremism in public life. Now, I think the secularist extreme is just as bad. So our vision is an alternative to both of them. And in a way, we're saying a plague on both your houses. <laughs> this is in nobody's advantage. Mm. We're in the interests of the common good. I suppose many people would say in response here in Britain, well, we are a Christian country, or at least we were up until recently. We were based, you know, uh, within a Christian framework. So we sort of have this history and we shouldn't just let it go in that of sense. Not. And so uh, many people feel like there is a battle, there is a culture war here, where there is a group of people on one side who want to rob us of uh, a Christian heritage. If, if we're Christian talking foundation. Christianly, of course there's a war, but the Bible talks about the war in the supernatural realm. And that is very profound. What Nietzsche called a war of spirits. But when the scriptures talk about other people, we're contending for the truth. And it's much more in legal terms than in battle terms. And of course, we're told to fight for the good of the cities in which we live, Jeremiah and so on. So Christians should pray for the peace of all people. And we've got to really follow the scriptures in doing this in a Christ-like way. So the American Christian right demonized their opponents. Jesus called us to love our enemies. And, and this is the problem, I think, that 
it does happen. There is always a danger, isn't there, of Christians eventually just being known for what they're against rather than what exactly. they're for. Exactly. And then there's a backlash against them. Absolutely. So the Global Charter of Conscience is aimed at, um, I suppose, presenting this new way of thinking about the public square. Who are you hoping to reach to influence with this particular Well, charter? at this stage, there's a small coalition of people who really understand the issues and a much wider group of scholars who are experts in religion and law and understand this. Now, there's the beginning of a grassroots movement, but we know well you can never win by a grassroots movement alone. The missing thing, and on many of this issue, this is true, is a political national leader of stature with moral courage and the ability to articulate vision. In America, and sadly also here, many of the political leaders, leaders just follow you know, the political trends and they just go with the culture warring style, and that is a disaster. We need someone, say in England, on the level of a Wilberforce, in America on the stature of a, an Abraham Lincoln prepared to stand above the fray and to articulate something in the national interest for the common good of all citizens, whether they're religious or even anti-religious, whether they're Christian, Jewish, Muslim, or whatever. And that's what this vision is about. Well, I wish you all the very best with it, and uh, we'll certainly be supporting you as you go forward. Oz, thank you for joining me today. Always a pleasure, Justin.